Welcome to Savvy Sabs Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest today is Kim Iverson. She is the host of The Kim Iverson Show. Welcome back, Kim. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I know we are definitely living in troubling times. Um, there's a lot going on in reference to Israel and Palestine. Uh, that seems to be the big topic of the entire week. Uh, from what I remember correctly, you actually had the opportunity to visit uh, the West Bank. So I want to get uh, some of your perspective about that, some of the things that you saw when you were there, and why did you decide to take that trip to begin with? Yeah, so I went there four years ago, almost four years ago exactly. I was there in October of 2019, and I was invited on the trip by a Palestinian, uh, American Palestinian organization, Christian American Palestinian organization that had watched my show. And I had talked about the BDS movement and um, some of the, the legislation to boycott BDS. And I had discussed it a little bit on my show. And so they invited, they invited me on a trip that they take annually with a bunch of clergy members to go and travel around and really visit the various holy sites and visit refugee camps and visit schools and visit um, places that the UN is overseeing, uh, going to Palestinian cities, checking out how they live, going over into Israel, seeing the Israeli cities and seeing how they live. And it was just this it's it's actually a cultural visit. It's a cultural um, trip that they do annually. They haven't done it since that year because of the pandemic and and now obviously there's just this year would not be a good year to do it because of the fighting. Um, but they were doing this trip annually, and so I I was invited. There was about eight of us that went. Most of them, everybody was pretty much clergy or medical staff. So a lot of Episcopalian priests or um, one I believe was like a either Lutheran or Methodist uh, minister and some health health officials like uh, doctors and nurses went along with with us on this trip. So there wasn't any like indoctrin indoctrination of like, oh, this is our side of the conflict and let us tell you some stories. There was no storytelling at all. Actually, it was just visiting site after site and place after place. And some of it was really fun, like floating in the Dead Sea and going and seeing the various different Christian holy sites and the various different Jewish and Muslim holy sites, because it is um, that land is, is very sacred to three different religions, and they all three have a lot of different sites there in the Holy Land, and it's just a really fascinating historical trip. But then we also went, you know, obviously if you're traveling around, and especially since our guides were Palestinian, we had to use the Palestinian roads and not the Israeli roads. We had to go through the Palestinian checkpoints. We were with Palestinians. So we had to experience traveling around in the region as Palestinians experience that. And that is with guns in your face and humiliation and life being made very difficult. Uh, we had a, a, a variety of different photographers with us and tour guides with us. And the reasoning is because in that region of the world, depending on where you were born, you're given different rights. So if you were born, for example, in the West Bank, then you're not allowed to travel into Jerusalem. You're not allowed to travel into Israel proper, not without special government permission. If you were born, it, no matter if you, so let's just say you're a Palestinian and you're a Palestinian born in the West Bank or you're Muslim even, let's just say. Most of the people I was with were Christian. I think the first thing, I guess I should say is, so I went with a Christian Palestinian organization. Many, many Palestinians in the West Bank are Christian people. And in fact, Ramallah, which is the main city in the West Bank, it's their, their main, it's like their capital of Palestine, is run by Christians. The mayor is Christian. Much of the government is Christian. Yes, much of the population is Muslim, but they, they live very, peacefully side by Christians and Muslims. And even I did meet a couple of, not very many, but there were some Palestinian Jews that I did meet um, in the West Bank. But the Christians in particular have really been very much in government positions in Palestine for a very long time. And um, 
So uh, if you're, let's just say you're a Christian Palestinian and you're born in the West Bank, you're born in Ramallah, or if you're a Christian Palestinian and you're born in Jerusalem, or you're a Christian Palestinian born in Israel, you're going to be given different rights depending on where you were born. This will affect who you marry because you cannot immigrate very easily. So if you're a Palestinian Christian born in Jerusalem and you go off to college in the West Bank and you meet a nice Christian girl from Bethlehem and you want to get married and the towns are like 15 minutes away from each other, 15, 20 minutes away from each other, you can the, your, your bride from Bethlehem cannot come and live with you in Jerusalem at your family home that you've had for 400 years. That's not allowed. If you're Jewish, you can. So if you're a Jewish person born in Jerusalem and you meet a Jewish person born in America and you want to bring them over to live in your family home in Jerusalem, you can do that. But you cannot do that if you are not Jewish. So um, so we had a variety of different guides and different photographers, depending on where they were born, based on where our trip was going that day. So if we were going into Jerusalem, then we needed to make sure that everybody on board the bus was a Jerusalemite or an American. So Americans are able to travel around freely. So if you are a Jerusalemite, then you are a Palestinian who holds a particular kind of like a green card for Jerusalem. And so we had to make sure that they were, or they could be Israeli um, Palestinians as well, or Israeli Arabs is what they're called. They could also be, if they had an Israeli passport or they had a Jerusalemite sort of green card or they had an American passport, then they could be on the bus that day to go to Jerusalem or to go into Tel Aviv. It was just extremely complicated. <laughs> I mean, they mm -hmm. make life very, very difficult. Um, but I think that's like the first thing for people to understand is going over there is that you're, you're granted citizenship class based on where you're born, based on your religion as well. Christians are second-class citizens in Israel. Israel is a Jewish nation. They've made that explicitly clear. It's in their constitution that it is a Jewish nation. So if you are an Israeli Christian or an Israeli Muslim or an Israeli, um, you could be atheist as long as your heritage is still Jewish. It's complicated. Then you're a second-class citizen if you're not Jewish and Israeli, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's so much to talk about with the trip, um, but it, it. But I think the first thing a lot of people think of the conflict, and they think it's it's like Muslims versus Jews, and that the Muslims yep. want to eradicate the Jews and whatnot. And that's just not. It's very much a Christian region. Palestinians are quite liberal for uh, even the even the uh, those who are, you know, like you don't have to wear a hijab, for example, even in Gaza, which is run by Hamas, which is considered a much more um, radical Islamic group, they, you, women are not required to wear head coverings in Gaza. Um, they, they promote it. They did have a campaign a few years back where they had representatives go around to the different Gazan schools and try to teach young girls that they should wear it and the reasons why they should wear it and whatnot. But nobody's forced to do anything like that. You're not forced to be a Muslim by any means. Um, so... So I think that's like the first thing for people to understand is that the Palestinians come in a variety of religions and yes, predominantly Muslim at this point, it wasn't always that way, but it is. And uh, many of the Christians were rooted out actually by the Israelis when they got there during the Nakba and during the, I think actually during the 1967 wars when the Christians were pretty much forced to flee. You're not legally... Okay, you are you are still legally allowed to proselyze to preach Christianity in Israel proper, but uh, they've actually tried to pass laws that actually would put you in jail for two years if you tried to preach Christian values in Israel to Israelis. Um, that did not go over well because there's a lot of Christian support for Israel to exist. And so they ultimately pulled the plug on that legislation. This was only just a a year ago. I mean, they've, this is recent. This is not like old timey stuff. This is recent. Um, but it's still, most Christians do not proselyze in Israel because they know that it is so completely, even though it's not illegal with two years of jail time, it's like culture, you, you know, you, you're not, you shouldn't do it there. It's not something they want you to do. So Christians are, are definitely second class citizens in Israel just very eye-opening over there, I think, seeing that it's 
you know, it, it's not the conflict we think that we're told, right? We're told it's Muslims versus Jews and the Muslims and Jews have been fighting for thousands of years and they want to, and the Muslims have been wanting to eradicate the Jews for a really long time. But what is lost in all of that are the Christians and the Christians are definitely second class citizens over there on, on, only on the Israeli side, not on the Palestinian side. They're in government positions in Palestine. Well, one of the things I saw, there was an interview recently with Max Blumenthal and Tim Poole. And Max Blumenthal was explaining to Tim, he said that this is not about the Bible. Right. Which is what I think a lot of a lot of Americans believe, that this is a religious issue. And Max Blumenthal, he's visited there, too. He wrote a book about it. Um, I know he primarily, I think, visited uh, Gaza. But he was also saying that, like, this is about creating an ethno state. This is not about right. the Bible. And I think it seemed like some of the guests that were on the panel and that show with Tim, they seemed quite surprised by that. Well, from a Christian perspective, it is about the Bible. So for Christians, Christians want to see the Jews returning to the Holy Land in order to fulfill the revelations that lead to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So there is this sort of giddiness and excitedness that Christians have as they see the end of times upon us because they're hoping to see the return of Jesus Christ and the reign of a thousand years of Jesus. Um, so from a religious perspective for Christians, they very much are pushing for Jews to return to the Holy Land for that reason. The reason why Israel started and the push to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land from the Jewish perspective is actually not rooted in religion. In fact, it's against the religion. And I'm not just saying like, oh, there's just some naive Zionists who wanted to, you know, they don't realize because they're not Torah scholars that it's actually against the Torah. No, these people that started the, the nationalist Zionist movement were atheists. They did not believe in Judaism. They hated Judaism. They, do not, they did not like Jewish religion. They were anti-Jewish in the religious sense. And they wanted to create, um, the, the, the father of Zionism, Herzl, was totally atheist and, did, and despised Judaism. So the movement was created by a bunch of secular, non-religious Jewish people that even when they abandoned their Judaism, when they were no longer believing in the actual religion, they were still persecuted as Jews everywhere they went. So if they were living in Germany, or it was mainly Russian. So Russian Jews were the ones that predominantly started Israel, which is why Israel won't condemn the Russia-Ukraine war. You know, they won't condemn Russia and the invasion because the people are Russian. I mean, many Israelis are Russian people. The irony mm -hmm. of that, many of them have dual citizenship with Russia and affinity for Russia. And so the irony of that, that the U.S., you know, being so anti-Russia right now and so supportive of Ukraine, but at the same time being pro-Israel, you're de facto in a way being very pro-Russian because many of the people in Israel speak Russian. They're Russians. The Russia has the biggest immigration into Israel than I think any other nation. <laughs> so the irony of that. but. Um, it was created by these, you know, they, they, they found that even when they gave up the religion, they were still persecuted as Jews. They were viewed as Jewish no matter what they did. They were viewed like as if it's an ethnicity. It's not really, but it was, it kind of turned into one in the eyes of the people in the world who were persecuting all these Jewish people. So it makes sense that Jewish people would feel this desire to find another place to go live where they could create a Jewish nation where they're not persecuted, where they're no longer the minority. I can appreciate the desire to want to do that. The issue is, is that they were given options on where to put this land. And the British wanted to give them, you know, they were trying to negotiate for where they could get this done. This was before World War II, before the Holocaust. And they were working with the German government, with the Nazi government, actually. And Nazis in the very beginning were um, I and mean, this is historically documented in the Encyclopedia Britannica. So this is not like some fringe stuff. You can read about this in the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, which is where I got this information. So the, the, the Zionists were actually, Nazis, the Nazi movement was actually really pro-Zionist movement for a variety of reasons. But before the Holocaust, before World War II, many of the Nazi leadership actually would travel over to Israel where the Zionist movement, before it was Israel, before it was an actual country, it was just like a colony. 
and they would go over there and they would visit and they'd actually write about it in their pamphlets and say, wow, this is like kind of a brilliant idea, like a home for just this one group of people. It's kind of where they got the idea where they were like, well, we let's create a home for one group of people over here. It's fundamentally a racist idea. So, but there was a lot of the Zionist movement would go to the British, they would go to the Nazis, they would go to all these various different governments and they would try to raise um, support for this, this Zionist movement, this nationalist movement for the Jews. And they were like, it'll solve your problem and ours. Um, you, you treat us like minorities, you don't really like us. Well, we can get out of your hair, help us out though, help us give us money, support, funding, uh, encouragement, to get Jewish people to some other place. But when they were first discussing this, there was other plots of land where this was discussed, uh, places in Africa that were much more desolate, areas of land where there were no people. But the Zionists realized that in order to, that there was just no one who really liked the idea. Jewish people didn't, there was no support in the Jewish world for Zionism, for this nationalist movement. Most Jews felt like they were Russian first and Jewish second, or they felt like they were, you know, German or British or French, whatever, right? So they just didn't have this desire to go to some random place in the world and like start up <laughs> in some mm -hmm. uncivilized spot. So it wasn't popular. So uh, Herzl was, he figured that the best place to put it would be this heritage. You know, remember this guy's an atheist. He doesn't give a shit about God, right? So he's like, holy sites, who cares? This guy doesn't believe in any of it. He thinks it's all fantasy fairy tale stuff. So he goes and sets up uh, in the, uh, says, well, but if I do it there, then I'll get maybe more Jewish support. I can maybe, maybe like tap into this. It was our home 3000 years ago. Let's do it. Let's reclaim this land. And it would just have more, there'd be more maybe support of going to that particular place because it would draw out this affinity. And, um, it still didn't really, actually. And then the British saw that the Arab population was not enjoying this newfound colonization of this of these Zionists that were showing up, and they saw that they were coming. and They and the Arabs listened to the the people that showed up, and the people said, "We want this land for ourselves." And the Arabs got really alarmed, and so they started to rise up against the Zionist movement. And the British then dropped the idea. They were like, okay, never mind. You can't have that land because that was British land. They were like, never mind. We're, we're not going to let you do this. This is a bad idea. And what happened was terrorism, actually. The Zionist movement and started to do massive acts of terrorism against the British in order to get the British to finally go along with this. So they terrorized the British until the British caved and said, all right, fine, you can have that land. And so the British went along with it. But the first terrorists in that in that region were absolutely the Zionist. They, this is historically documented. They were they committed major acts of terrorism and then they continued to terrorize the Arab population, literally like, like uh, for example, taking over hospitals and just storming into the hospital and literally taking it over and living in the hospital for a year or two years, just like taking it over and saying this it, armed, armed terrorists storming into a building, taking it and then living in it for years. <laughs> in a, you know, I mean, just like real crazy stuff when you read the stories of how the Zionists first started. I mean, they were nuts. You'd have to be nuts. I mean, to think about the type of person who wants to leave the coziness of their like European lifestyle where they have running water, electricity, they've got buildings, you know, they have, you know, all these things, right. That you would have, imagine how nuts you would have to be in your own mind to think I'm going to leave all of this because maybe my neighbors aren't that nice. I'm going to leave all of this. I'm going to go hunker down in some random place where there's people who are hostile against me and I'm going to mm -hmm. take over their build. I mean, you'd have to be, like legitimately a bit crazy off your rocker, right? In order to agree, think that that's a good idea. So that's really how it started. And it's, you know, they've gained a lot of, after the Holocaust, there was clearly a lot of support for the notion of giving the Jews a safe place to go live. Ironically, Israel is the least safe for a Jew to live in the world. Um, there is, I, I right now currently live in like little Tel Aviv, 
Um, I'm, I, I don't live in a Jewish neighborhood. I live in an Israeli neighborhood. All of my neighbors are Israeli immigrants who have moved to Los Angeles. Um, and, you know, why did they leave? Why did they leave Israel? I ask them all the time. Like every contractor who comes to work on my house is an Israeli immigrant. All of my neighbors are Israeli immigrants. All the signs in my neighborhood are in Hebrew. Why did they leave Israel? Why? They all say, because it wasn't safe. <laughs> they didn't want to live yeah. there. You know, yeah. they're like, we're being bombed. There's like constant threat of terrorism. They don't want to live in this place that is supposed to be this like safe haven for the Jews. It's like the least place safe, the, the least safe place where they could live. I heard that when I lived in Brooklyn too, because I used to live by the avenues in Brooklyn. So I lived in a, in a Jewish neighborhood. It's more gentrified now, but this was years ago. But um, over there in, in Midwood section of Brooklyn, and I heard the same thing. They said that it was not safe for them over there. It was really, yeah. a really interesting experience because everything in that neighborhood was Jewish owned, except for that one Italian pizza shop on the mm -hmm. corner, but everything else was, was Jewish owned. Like they had their own schools and everything. But I remember asking one of them about that before. And they said that like, it's not safe over there. Yeah. 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 It's not safe. And you know, it's interesting. I live in this very, like I said, it's little Tel Aviv. So these are all Israeli immigrants that are, you know, they have the Israeli accents and, and interesting, you know, names that are very Israeli. Um, and I'm also living right next door to an ultra Orthodox Jewish neighborhood where they, you know, they're like wearing the dark and then the top yep. hats and they have the ring, you know, they're very, very, very ultra Orthodox. And it's interesting because the ultra, ultra, ultra Orthodox tend to be very against the idea of Israel and the Zionist movement. Um, and then I've mm -hmm. got all these Israelis living next to me that have abandoned, you know, I mean, they still maybe have affinity for their homeland. For them, this is tr truly their homeland, they've immigrated to the United States and have become maybe American citizens, maybe, maybe not. Um, but that is their homeland. Unlike Jews, American Jews, Israel's not their homeland. Israel claims that they're the land for all Jews, but the vast majority of Jews in the world have no connection to Israel whatsoever, have never even been there, don't have any desire to go or live there. You know, they're just, na they're, they're citizens of their home countries. And then they're told by this foreign country in the Middle East that, well, we're your country too. And mm -hmm. um, that is very, that's, that actually breeds anti-Semitism for many Jewish people who just are American. They don't have any desire to even go to Israel. They don't, you know, <laughs> it's some weird Middle Eastern country to them. And, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really the concept of the country and the, uh, the founding of the country is, you know, we're never taught this stuff. And I think it's because mm -hmm. Christians were predominantly a Christian country. And the yep. idea is just that, well, what we know from the book of Revelations is that the Jews have to return to the Holy Land for the second coming of Christ to happen. And they're going to fight a war. And they're just watching this unfold. And they're like, yeah, this is the, this is the end of times. It's great. <laughs> Yeah, what's really interesting to me is uh, one of the things I've noticed, and I'm sure you've noticed this too, mainly across mainstream media, everybody seems to be, you know, calling out the attack from Hamas, right? And so some of these stories have already been debunked about the beheaded, the beheaded babies, like that's yeah. already been debunked and stuff like that. But as soon as you bring up the casualties that are happening to the Palestinian people and you talk about what's been happening to them over the past couple of years, how they're basically living in an open air prison and they have limited yeah, electricity and 17 yeah. years. They've been living like that in Gaza specifically, but decades yeah. they've been living as, in under massive oppression. Right. As, as soon as you start to bring that up, like people get very angry. In fact, there was just an exchange. I don't know if you saw this. There was an exchange on rising with Brie and Robbie. Yeah. I'm going to talk <laughs> about that tonight. <laughs> I did see that. Yeah, like it was it was very heated. And I just thought to myself, like, do Americans or do you feel that American people just don't seem to have that same type of compassion for the Palestinians? And if so, do you think that's because they're Muslim or do you think it's because they just kind of relate them to Hamas? Yeah, um, it's tricky. I think the vast majority of Americans are just ignorant to not by their fault by any, any means. I mean, it's what we're taught in schools and what we're not taught in the media. Um, I just think that there's a lack of understanding of what is really going on over there. So there's, mm -hmm. for one, just a, a full-on lack of awareness. 
Two, I think there's the Christian, like I mentioned, the Christian push of it, you know, it doesn't just ignore that because there's the, the greater idea of we need the Jews to go to the Holy Land in order for the second coming of Jesus Christ to happen. So we just got to keep pushing for this and support Israel. Um, I mean, I, I think mostly it's just ignorance. I just think people are not aware of the founding of Israel. I think most people believe that Israel was founded because of the Holocaust, and that yep. is not true. Um, so there's just a lack of historical awareness of, you know, and everything I've said about Israel and its founding, a lot of people would, would hear that and say, oh, listen to this anti-Semite listen to this Jew hater, right? Like that's what I hear all the time online. And I'm just giving you historical fact. I mean, what we do with the history is another question altogether. Um, the history of the founding of Israel is atrocious and it is rooted in terrorism from these Zionists against the British primarily. And then against, and then secondly, then they started terrorizing the Arab population there. Um, that is just historical fact. It's also historical fact, however, that the colonizing of the United States was atrocious as well. What the United States did to, you know, what the colonizers did to the indigenous people was atrocious. All of those things are true. So it's all historical fact. The question is now, what do we do with that historical fact? I do not think that it follows then that because the past and the founding of this country was atrocious, that we should all just abandon the land and give it back to the indigenous people, right? Like, I don't, I don't think that that's the solution. Um, I also don't think that's the solution in Israel either, that the solution be, okay, well, it was, you know, now all the Jews need to leave and and give it back to the Palestinian people. I don't think that's what follows. Um, and so we can acknowledge historical fact without it thinking it leads to a, a, another line of thinking of like, that means this nation, you know, these people need to be eradicated or they need to be moved or, you know, there needs to be another catastrophe and Nakba of removing the Jews out of Israel, for example, or moving the uh, white people, Americans or non-indigenous out of, out of the, out of North America. So that, yeah. so then, th th then that's, you know, that's where the conversation has to then you know, what do we do with this information? But first people should just know the information. And when it comes to Israel, they don't know it. They don't know it at all. And for a long time, people said that a two-state solution was the right, the right solution. And then it was just actually two years ago that someone educated me about that and explained to me that that would not work because there's too many settlements, et cetera, which for a long time, I thought two-state solution made perfect sense. And so I, I woke up to that as well. And so now I just kind of ask, like, what is the solution? Like, why can't they live together in harmony? And then it goes back to something that Aaron Mate said recently about there was this call for a peace negotiation, which I was not aware of this until like three days ago. Mm -hmm. So I want to show a clip really quick. So you probably saw this already, but I want to show you what RFK Jr. said, because I clipped this. I saw this interview and I clipped it. And then I saw the exchange that Katie and Aaron had on useful idiots about the fact that there actually was a resolution for 2002. So this was new to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't aware of that. So I want to go ahead and share this clip here from RFK. This was atrocious for me, but he said it. And here it goes. All of us saw the, the videos on social media of children in cages in Gaza, of, uh, of Jewish bodies, of a teenage girl being abused in front of a crowd and people cheering, um, of you know bodies being paraded around in trucks. So to say that Israel is at fault for that is just perverse. And then if you if you look at the history of the region, anybody who you know believes that narrative, which is a propaganda narrative, should go look at Prince Bandar bin Sultan's speech in 2020. He was a great champion. He was the head of um, Saudi intelligence. He was at all the peace negotiations. He's a huge champion, lifelong champion of the Palestinian people. And what he said again and again, the Palestinians have been betrayed by their leadership. You know, Yasser Arafat died a billionaire. Mahmoud Abbas, the current leader of 
the Palestinian Authority is a billionaire. His sons are 100 millionaires. They keep their people in poverty. Again and again, the Israelis have offered peace on extremely generous terms. Uh, you know, they, Ehud Barak in 2000 offered again and again, 1937, 1947, 2000, the Israelis have wanted to trade peace for land. And they, uh, again and again, the Palestinian leadership has betrayed its own people by refusing to even negotiate about that or refusing to a counter offer. Okay, so uh, that information from RFK about the peace negotiation, that's actually incorrect. And I don't know who's educating him about this issue, but I know there have been multiple people that have been willing to have this conversation with him, Max Blumenthal being one of them, people who have actually traveled to that region and they've they've seen it for themselves, what's happening to the Palestinian people. But the part about the peace negotiation, which I think is especially important because uh, it was actually on Useful Idiots where I saw this and then I had to look this up for myself to see what Aaron was referring to. But the 2002 uh, Arab peace negotiation, this part right here. Israel, if it wanted to, could have had peace, not just with Saudi Arabia, but all the Arab states and also Iran uh, and the Palestinian territories more than two decades ago. Because in 2002, the Arab League endorsed what's called the Arab Peace, the Arab peace Initiative, which basically the deal was get Israel to withdraw from all the occupied territories, the West Bank and Gaza, let a Palestinian state be created there, have a just resolution to the Palestinian refugee uh, issue, and in return, all the Arab states will recognize Israel fully. Hamas later on tacitly accepted this proposal, okay. not formally, but they tacitly accepted it by saying they would accept a state within the pre-1967 borders, which means you're not going to uh, oppose a state within Israel's recognized borders of pre-1967. Israel, if it wanted to, could have had... Okay, so uh, that part right there. So after I saw that conversation, I actually researched that myself about that peace negotiation. And Aaron is correct there. I know at one point, I know you were a, you know, a strong supporter of RFK Jr. I did see on Twitter that you were not happy about the comment that he made that we need to support Israel and give them whatever they need, because that kind of goes against him being a peace candidate, obviously. Right. Uh, he is horrible on this particular issue, and I don't know you know, what else needs to be said to him. I don't understand why he won't have this conversation with someone like Aaron or Max or people who, or, or Katie, uh, people who are Jewish and have been to the region and are very familiar with the history. Um, I kind of believe some of it may have to do with APAC. I think he might be afraid that he's going to get challenged by the Israeli lobby and they're going to push against him just like they did Nina Turner, even though Nina Turner came out and said that she supports, you know, Israel and things like that. So I, I think that that's where it's coming from because his campaign manager is Dennis Kucinich. And I do remember Dennis Kucinich on the national stage standing up for the fight of the Palestinian people. So to me, it just seems very strange that he's not willing to hear the other side of this. But this is important, an important part about the history that there was an offer for peace and the state of Israel actually rejected it. And I'm curious to hear what you think about that. It's it's all um, very complicated, actually, because everybody is right and everybody is wrong on this issue. Um, it is true that the Palestinian leadership has failed the Palestinian people over and over again. I don't know about them, you know, the, the claims that they're billionaires or hundred millionaires, or if they were robbing the people blind. I'm, I would imagine it's true because that seems to be true for every politician in the world, in every government in the world, that they just take advantage of the people and they all get rich. Being a politician seems to be a get rich quick scheme. Um, so maybe, maybe that's true. I have no doubt, though, that the Palestinian people whom I spoke to in Palestine absolutely were against their leadership in a lot of ways, that their leadership had failed them, their leadership had done, made bad decisions, that their leadership had led them partially on this path. That being said, the, the, the bulk of the responsibility still lies on Israel and Israel's treatment of the Palestinian people because Israel is more powerful than any of the leadership that the Palestinians would have. Israel's always been the mightier one. So Israel then takes advantage of the fact that the leadership is taking advantage of the people. And Israel knows this 
So rather than circumvent that, rather than say, let's root out the corruption, we need to work with better leaders, rather than, you know, in good faith, actually doing what they should do on behalf of the Palestinian people, they they used the corruption in the Palestinian leadership for their own gain. And they just thought, all right, well then, you know, more opportunity for us to take more land, more opportunity for us to siphon resources from the Palestinian people, more opportunity for us rather than doing the right thing, which is demand better leadership from the Palestinians. Um, and, you know, and, and, and that's because, why is that? Well, that is because the Israeli government is also corrupt and crooked and filled with a bunch of thieves. I mean, that's politicians in general, like I just said. So um, whether they be Ukrainian or Israeli or Palestinian or American politicians, they all just seem to be just siphoning resources from the people whom they're supposed to serve. So there is some truth to that for sure. There's also truth to the fact that Israel just claimed that it was going to do these peace negotiations and essentially um, never fulfilled their, op their, their end of the obligations. I mean, they kept building settlements in the West Bank when they said that they would stop Everybody's asked them to stop expanding, stop taking land, that, that when you take land, when you expand, you undermine any possible peace negotiation and they still do it. So it isn't just, oh, the Palestinians had bad leadership. It's the Israelis have bad leadership too. And that leadership is still going and building settlements and taking land indiscriminately. And they're not stopping. They're not slowing down, especially under Benjamin Netanyahu. So, um, so it's all of it. The two-state solution, there still could be a two-state solution. I, I, I've i always been an advocate of the two-state solution. When I was over there, I was convinced of a, of a two-state solution. I do not think those people can easily live with each other, Jews and Arabs. I think there, there's a lot of tension, a lot of anger, obviously. Um, on both sides, They there is a lot of hatred for each other. So it'd be very difficult for them to live with each other. So I've always been an advocate of the two-state solution. I understand that it seems difficult because of the settlements in the West Bank, but I say, so what? Um, if you're, this is what happened in Gaza, for example. There was a time when there were a lot of settlements in Gaza, Jewish settlements in Gaza. Um, ultimately, the government said, this land is now Gazan, Palestinian run, and you should evacuate. You should get out. If you don't want to live there, you should probably get out. And they did. The Jewish settlers that were living in Gaza left and they abandoned their homes in Gaza. That could be done also in the West Bank, um, I, I, or or there could be a scenario if the tensions could lessen. And I think once people are given the independence, once the Palestinian people are given their sovereignty and their rights and dignity back, I do think that the tensions would lessen. There have been many times in history where Arabs and Jews live side by side, intermixed, without any issues. The reason why they can't right now is because it's been decades, and for especially the younger population in their 20s, this is the only thing they've ever known, is being under the gun, being in oppression, being humiliated regularly, having their lives regularly disrupted, constantly worrying about their homes being destroyed or the universities being raided, their schools being shut down. I mean, they're constantly living like this, and now they're these kids in, these tw in their 20s. That's the only life they've ever known, so they hate the Jewish population. And the Jewish population, vice versa, that the young ones in particular hate the Arabs. The older generation, however, remembers a time when they were all friends and they don't hate each other as much. It's the younger generation that hates. But the younger generation are the ones that are going to fight because there's that's the fighting age. Those are the ones that are going to be recruited into the IDF or into um, some brigade, right? That's so it's it's extra violent right now. But they could, you know, theoretically just say that land is now the West Bank. And if you're in an Israeli, if you're in a Jewish settlement in the West Bank, you now live in Palestine. So you have a choice. You can either stay in Palestine and live under Palestinian rule and commute to your job in Israel or whatever you do, or you can move. Uh, so to me, the option of a, of a two state solution is still there. It's still very much there. I think, though, whether they go in that direction or not, I, I've now been recently convinced a, away from a two-state solution and now towards a one-state solution. Um, I think they could have one state, like one federation, two states, like we do here in the United States. We have 50 of them. They could have mm -hmm. two, let's say, or three, like Gaza could be one. And, you know, they could they could kind of break it up and have a, a federation with, with a, three or four different states. Um, 
but the the reason now I I now favor a one, more of a one state solution is because I don't think Israel should exist as the way Israel exists right now as a nation. I don't think mm-hmm. there should be a Jewish nation. I think it should be a normal nation um, that is not for any one group. You know, it's in their constitution that if you're not Jewish, you are not that that, that is a land for Jews. And there's very specific rules on how you can be a Jew. And you, so if you're not a Jew, then you are not baked in the constitution. It's not considered your land. And you might have, if you're an Israeli Arab, you might have the same human rights as any other Israeli in Israel, just by virtue of being an Israeli Arab and having that Israeli passport, but you don't have the same community rights or the same um, right of you know, as a, as you are not, you are still a second class citizen in that country. Um, So I I do think that that needs to end. The the notion that Israel is for Jews, um, Japan is for the Japanese, France is for the Mm. French, America is for the Americans, Israel should be for Israelis, but instead Israel is for Jews. And that is something we should all oppose and say that is that's not okay. That'd be like saying America's for Christians, or America's for whites, or America's for European descendants, right? Um, no, we say America's for Americans, and then anybody can become an American in this country. Anybody. My family's Vietnamese; they're Americans. The other fa- part of my family's Danish; they're Americans. Um, So that's, I do think that concept of Israel now, I used to be for like a home for the Jews, but now I'm like, no way. That's, it is fundamentally racist and it's not even working. I mean, the whole notion of it was like, oh, a home for the Jews so that they could be safe. Well, it's not working. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) abandon it. It's, It's a bad idea. It's causing problems. The Holy Land also on top of that, what gives any group the right to claim the Holy Land? Like, who do you think you are? So the Holy Land is for Christians, for Muslims, and for Jews. And you've got now one group, the Jewish people coming in and saying, no, it's ours. And this is a land for Jews now. And it's like, how how do you figure? I mean, it's the Holy Land. So in my viewpoint, they should, you know, Israel, even as a name for the country, is pointing to Jews uh, because that's like the descendant, the Abrahamic descendant, the lineage for Jewish people. So they should either rename it like the land, like Abraham rather than Israel. They can name it Abraham if they want um, or Holy. I think it should just be renamed the Holy Land and you could be from the Holy Land like you're from the Netherlands or something like I'm from the Holy Land. And it should be a nation that allows equal citizenship under their constitution, whether you be Muslim, Christian, Jewish, or if a Buddhist wants to move there for some random reason uh, for work opportunity or whatever, then they should it should be a normal nation. And that might actually correct, you know, they could have different states where they have like the more Arab state or the more Jewish state inside of this federation, but it does need to be giving equal rights to everybody and equal equal opportunities, equal citizenship, the ability to live in each other's communities if you so fit. And if somebody commits crime, hostilities, acts of terror, they should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law under the land of the Holy Land. Well, one of the things, one of the points that's been raised by uh, Human Rights Watch and also the UN is that particularly the the Palestinians that are living in like the the refugee camps, number one, one of the things that they've mentioned is that a fence is not a border. So we were talking about this on the show a couple of days ago. Essentially, it's like they're treating Gaza like it's a separate country. And they also said that like, you know, this is a human rights issue because you have people living in, in Gaza where like 90% of the water is dirty water. They're given like two to three hours of electricity a day. And that, that includes the hospitals too. So if someone has to perform surgery, I mean that, you know, that kind of thing, like they control the food that cold that goes into Uh, Gaza. So apparently also certain foods are not allowed to come in. And now we see that they're saying they're cutting off the water and the food and all electricity. Like, I don't understand on a international level how this is allowed to happen, because especially if human rights says this is 
this is a big issue. And then you see the United States government saying that they are willing, we'll send them aid, we'll send you know the state of Israel aid so that they can do what they need to do. Lindsey Graham is on TV telling people to flatten uh, Gaza, which there's what, 2 million people in Gaza, 1 million yeah. of them are children. Like this is really appalling. And I have this feeling that this is gonna be the US government's way to start or excuse to start some type of conflict with Iran. Well, there's definitely always been the the appetite for that, certainly by people like Lindsey Graham. Um, that is why it's so I think alarming RFK Jr.'s stance on Israel and his when he when he makes comments like we need to support them in their military endeavors. Um, that the reason why that is so alarming. It's it's fine if you want to if you want to support a nation and you love a nation and um, w whatever. But once you start pledging military support for military operations, that's when I have a real big problem. And that is why I have decided I can't vote for RFK Jr. If you're gonna put us in harm's way, Americans in harm's way, and just endless wars, the Israeli conflict, I mean, this is, they've, they pick a fight and other countries pick a fight with them. Whoever, it doesn't matter if they're picked on or if they're the picker, if, or if they're the ones who are doing the picking, right? It's that, it's a region of the world that's been at war for, a much, much longer than our lifetimes preceding everybody who's alive today. And it'll probably go beyond all of our lifetimes of anybody who's alive today. Let them work it out on their own over there. I mean, we just cannot be getting involved. And I don't want to be backing any politicians that, that's going to continue us into endless war. The Middle East in particular is the area of the world in my lifetime that we've been at war with. And I just don't wanna see that continue. So he was really alarming to me. But yeah, Gaza, going back to the point of, you know, they're in control. When I was in, when I went over there, I did meet with Israeli, um, I, I did spend some time on the Israeli side and I did meet with members of the Knesset, which is their parliament. Um, I met with members of the, uh, the Arab members. So the Arab Israelis who are like Palestinian by birth, but they live in Israel. So they're Israeli and they're considered Arab Israelis. And they were members of the Knesset. They're in government. Um, there's a good number of them who are elected to government. They're not a majority, so they don't really have any power, but they're there and they're representative of their people. And I met the member of the Knesset who actually advocated for macaroni to be allowed to be sent into Gaza for whatever reason, the Israelis weren't allowing the children to have macaroni and cheese. I mean, it was just like, why? What kind of security threat is macaroni? But they just do things like that to the people just to do things like that. It's not really truly about security. I mean, they weren't allowing crayons in for kids because they were like, well, crayons could be like melted down and turned into bombs. I mean, it was just <sighs> so... They, they, they don't allow, they make excuses. Like you can't have macaroni, you can't have crayons, you can't have all of these things just to make their lives so miserable. The, the reality of it is when I was there, one thing was very, very, very clear. And that is the goal is to get rid of the Palestinians, to make them leave, to make their lives so miserable that they don't want to stay there anymore, that they would rather go to Jordan, they'd rather go live in Egypt, they'd rather go live in some other Arab nation that is not their home, and that they should just go, even though they've lived on this land, their families have been there for hundreds of years, they're being told, pack your bags and move to a different Arab nation. And we hear that a lot, the rhetoric here in the United States of, there's a lot of Arab nations, they could just go live in any of the other Arab nations, like why do they have to live on that land? Well, because they've lived there for hundreds of years. It's like saying to you, you don't need America, like get off the land now. So the natives are coming back, they're taking it, the indigenous people, uh, you, you know, Kim, your, your family's from Vietnam, just go back to Vietnam, you could go live there, like just go, right? Yep. It's like, well, I, I mean, I was born here and I was raised here, so I don't, why would I pack my bags and go live somewhere else suddenly because you think that this land is yours? So there's this, it's really clear that they were doing everything they could and, and it, it, the, the way, you know how it becomes incredibly clear, it becomes crystal clear, this notion that they're just trying to make Palestinians go away when you talk to the Palestinian Americans living in the West Bank. There are Americans, Americans born and raised in the United States, born in Ohio, born in Laguna Hills, California, born in the United States, but they are Palestinian by ethnicity. 
and their families immigrated away from Palestine during the 1967 war. They were expelled. They came here to the United States. They're Christians. And now during the Oslo Accords, there was this opportunity. People thought we can go back and build Palestine. And a lot of American, the children, the, the, the parents thought, let's go back and build. And the American children who are now adults thought, okay, yeah, let's go back and build Palestine. And they would go and live, and they're living in the West Bank right now as we speak. They have businesses. They were, they were born in the United States. They were educated in the United States. They hold American passports. They speak like you and me. They barely speak Arabic, half of them. You know, they're like struggling with their Arabic. <laughs> they're, they're Americans. And they're treated like second-class citizens by the Israelis once the Israelis figure out what they're doing there. So the Israelis will let an American Palestinian travel around. I, I met one guy in particular and he, you know, said his first three years. So he grew up in California, went to University of Colorado, party guy. His parents wanted to start a business. They started a business over there in Palestine. He ended up having to go run the business. And he said the first three years were awesome. He was going into Tel Aviv. He was going nightclubbing. He was going to the beaches. He was having a good time traveling around because he was an American Palestinian. So he had extra rights that the Palestinian people he was living amongst did not have. He had the freedom of movement to go around everywhere. The minute, three years in, the Israelis figured out what he was really doing there. And they're like, oh, you're here to build Palestine? Mm, that, that's it. Your American passport is no longer good. He cannot now. His grandmother lives in Jerusalem. And he cannot travel to see his own grandmother in Jerusalem. Because when the Israelis figured out that he was there to build Palestine, what they do to the Americans is they say, then you're no longer, you're now treated like a West banker. You are not given Jerusalemite status, which allows you to at least, if you're a Palestinian in Jerusalem, you actually can travel into Israel and the West, but you have more freedom of movement. Um, if you're an Israeli, you have all the freedom of movement. If you're a Jerusalemite, you also have freedom of movement, but you don't have the freedom to bring somebody to come live where in your home. An Israeli can, unless you're an Arab. And but if you're a West Banker, then you're you're you can only stay in the West Bank and you can't travel. So as an American, the only um, he'd have he has to appeal to the Israeli government to get permission to visit his own grandmother living in Jerusalem, 20 minutes away from his house, and his business suffers. Like they won't allow imports for his business. You know, an Israeli and him order goods from the same company overseas, and they're ordering for the shipment to come in. The Palestinian business owner will say to me, yeah, um, an American sitting there saying, yeah, you know, they held up my goods for three years at the port, whereas the Israeli friend of mine that I called him up and he said that he got the same goods within three days, you know, but they held up his goods for three years. So they're, it, it's obvious. This is not about, these Americans are Americans. They're not terrorists. The Israel, they're getting American money from these Palestinians still that are Americans living over there. And yet they treat them like they're the terrorists. And it's not because they really think they're terrorists. They know they're not. They're treating them that way because they want them to go away. They want the Palestinians to stop building. They don't want Palestine to build up to be any great place where people want to live. They don't want the Palestinian people there. They want them gone. And it, it, it's extremely clear when you meet all of the various Americans over there who are American Palestinians. That's when it becomes crystal clear what's really happening. So their goal is to get rid of all these people. What's happening in Gaza right now, the goal is, you know, they tried to appeal, the Israelis wanted Egypt to open up a humanitarian refugee corridor, saying, we're going to bomb the crap out of Gaza. You should open up the corridor and let all the refugees into Egypt. Egypt says, bull crap, we're not, we're not going to do that because we know what your goal is, and that is you're going to bomb Gaza from the north, all in, which is what they're doing now. They're saying they're pushing people out of the north. They're trying to push mm -hmm. them south towards the Egyptian border. And they're going to bomb it and bomb it and bomb it and bomb it, hurting all the people to that Egyptian border until they could, in, until it's overcrowded, overloaded, and Egypt is pressured into no choice but to open up the gates and let them in. Israel wins the war at that point. Now there's no Palestinians in Gaza. And now it's free land for the Israelis to come back. You know, they'll bomb, they'll level the whole place and they'll say, good, we just cleared out all the buildings. We're going to build new ones anyway. And they're going to build up their new buildings. And the Gazans will, that's why it's important that we don't, you know, when we fall for the trap online, for example, 
when Egypt rejects the humanitarian refugee corridor or Jordan rejects refugees or you know, all these Arab nations reject refugees, the the cries online are how dare they you know these people are going to be massacred so you got two camps you know one camp saying they're going to be massacred in gaza they're going to be massacred these other arab nations they must they must it's like an act of humanitarian they must but then you've got a lot of the like super pro israel people saying see nobody wants them they're horrible yeah. they're they're all terrorists nobody nobody will take them the truth is is that the narrative of Israel, you know, Israel's the one pushing for those humanitarian refugee corridors to be open because they're trying to get rid of the Palestinians. And once those corridors are open, they will bomb the people and herd them to the gates and then get them to shove through the gates so that they're just gone. It's just a land clearing is what they're, and the Arab nations know this, so they're not falling for that tactic. The Palestinians know this, they're not clamoring at those gates to get in. They're, they're, they're wanting to stand their ground, they're standing firm that they're, they're, they resist by existing. So they're not moving. They don't want to move. They don't want to leave their homes. They will be bombed. They're saying, if you're going to bomb me, then bomb me. But then the world will see what you've done. The world will see you're a barbarian. And that's, that's what they're trying to do is get rid of the Palestinian people. It's very obvious. Yeah, for people who may not be aware, like imagine, because some people are complaining online and they're saying that like, you know, Egypt, this is your fault. You need to open up your borders and let them in. And I'm saying, well, but at the same time, you don't want the U.S. to open up our right, borders and right. let people in. <laughs> so Yeah, and Egypt just, said that when they said, when they rejected the humanitarian refugee corridor, they specifically said both things. They said, first of all, we can't take 2 million refugees. Are you nuts? <laughs> like, like, can you, can your country handle suddenly 2 million people in? No, that's insane to even ask for a country to bear the burden. They're saying this is Israel's problem, not ours, and they cannot be pawning off their problem to us, you know, shoving 2 million people in our direction and making us take care of those 2 million people when they should be taking care of those 2 million people. So Egypt has that, but then Egypt also says, and yeah, right, guys, like we're on to you. You wanna clear the land and we are supportive of the Palestinian cause, which is their right to that land. And you guys need to settle that dispute. You don't get to just get rid of the people. And Egypt said this, I mean, they said this in their statement, both things saying, yeah, you guys are just trying to get rid of these people to solve your problem. And secondly, we can't take the, it, like it's a non-starter as it is for Egypt. They're like, it's a non-starter. We can't take 2 million people. But even if we could, we wouldn't because this is a land dispute that you guys need to work out and you're not gonna clear the land off of the people and, and make everybody on both sides, the, the people who are, who are sympathetic to the Palestinians and the people who are sympathetic to the Israeli cause of having the whole land to themselves, you know, the, 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 that the Israel asking all these countries to open up humanitarian refugee corridors, they know those countries are going to say no for these reasons. And then they use that and they say, see, see, it's all these other countries fault. Nobody wants them. And that propaganda uh, does spread throughout online and both sides gobble it up. You know, the humanitarians who are so sad about what's going on with the Gazans gobble it up and say, oh my gosh, they should open up. You know, how dare they? They should open up the borders and help. But, mm -hmm. they, they, but then Israel wins the war. That's like defeating the entire purpose. That's like saying, let's just bring in all the Ukrainians to America. If we just immigrate them over, then the Russian invasion stops overnight like that. They will be scapegoats wherever they go, Kim. If they go to Jordan, they will be scapegoats. If they go to Egypt, they will be scapegoats, just like the Ethiopians, well, there are Ethiopian Jews now in Israel. Remember, they first came in as refugees and then they had families. So they're, they have children that were actually born in Israel and they are Jewish and they, they're not wanted there either. And th right, that's yeah. the thing, like wherever they go, they're going to be seen as like, you know, Egypt could say years from now, our economy is a mess because you came here. And right. that's that's the other thing that people are gonna have to deal with as well. Yeah, I mean, it's just not tenable to have seven, I think there's seven or 8 million Palestinians in total between Gaza and the West Bank. I mean, it's just not tenable to have them all immigrate out or, or become refugees in foreign countries. Refugees already have a difficult time in a foreign country. My family are refugees, so I understand this. Um, you know, so you're always, and refugees, by the way, always long for home. I mean, that is one thing that as a kid, to be honest with you, I was afraid of. <laughs> I was often afraid of it because my Vietnamese family, which are refugees, war refugees, 
They didn't immigrate to America because they wanted an American dream. They came to America because they were escaping war. And uh, they often talked about going back. And I heard this conversation a lot as a kid and it always freaked me out because I'd be like, I don't wanna go back, I was born here. So it becomes a problem for refugees when they start having children because then the children are like, go back to where, you know? Like, I'm not going back to Vietnam. I've never even been there. I've never stepped foot in that country. I mean, I technically have citizenship there, I suppose, because they have that whole rule of if your mom is a Vietnamese citizen, then you are, you know, right, whatever. But um, that always that always frightened me as a kid. So that is something that refugee, because, but that's how refugees are. Refugees often hope that they can return to their home. They hope that the war calms down. They hope that things go the right way and they hope that they can go back. But then time passes and reality sets in and they've got homes in their new country and businesses and jobs and children and their children are having children and now they have grandchildren. It's, it, you know, it's, it's not realistic for refugees to then return back home. Um, it doesn't happen very often for those reasons. And so, so it's, it's, you know, being a refugee is a really tough thing. You long for your home, but now you're in this new place and the new place might not really totally accept you. But now you have families and children and, you know, I mean, you're, you're just not. But the Palestinian people have a right to that land. They don't want to give it up. And having them run into all the other Arab countries is them giving up the fight and losing. And they're not ready to do that. They still hold on to hope that the world, especially now with the Internet, the world mm -hmm. is now seeing what's actually happening. And the world is opening up their eyes. And that is what we're seeing you know, this time around, I think with what's going on, I mean, we are all very sympathetic to what happened to the Israelis. I've seen the videos, the massacre that Hamas did on this on the Israeli people, and it is atrocious. It's really, atro I mean, you know, there's definitely some propaganda stuff of like, oh, the beheaded babies and things that we never saw. But the images, the video, the videos I've seen of the attacked Israelis is horrible. And I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. I just would not wish that on anybody. I, these, these kids that were just having a good time and then they were slaughtered and they were piled up. I mean, it was, it's horrible, but that, that horror, you know, we cannot then go into vigilante justice and then turn around and enact the same terror on the people who terrorized us. And you know, we are, we, we pride ourselves on being a civilized people and an enlightened people. And we believe in due process and and justice and rules of war. And yet what is happening now is barbarism on the Israeli side. I get that they're angry. I understand that they're hurt, they're angry, but they're they're taking their anger to a level that many in the world are saying, this is too far, guys. This is just too, you know, you this is too much. And that narrative, I, th I think what we're seeing now because of the internet and people are able to see that is, there is much more robust dialogue and debate about this. We're not seeing that in the political class still, but amongst regular people, we are seeing less, I think, just staunch support for Israel blindly, no matter what. I think we're seeing the tide shift where more people are saying, wait a minute. I mean, I get it. I'm angry too, but we don't do this. You know, you if you get raped in this country, what we do is we have the police go after the attacker and the police arrest that person and that person goes to court. We don't gang rape that person or slaughter their family because they were the rapist and their family hid them up in their house. You know, we don't do that in this country. We believe we are a civilized and enlightened people and the Israelis need to showcase that a bit, but they're not and the world is waking up to that. So I think now the narrative, it's interesting the tide is shifting and I think in favor of the Palestinians and there Israel's going to have a very difficult time in the future because the internet's just getting better and better. They, and by the way, they, they tried to not give the Palestinians internet for a really long time. When I was over there only four years ago, they barely got 3g when I was there. Israel oh controls, Yeah. Israel controls the airspace, the groundwater, the ports, like everything. So they weren't allowing them the cell phone towers. I met with an American Palestinian business owner who owns the largest telecom company in Palestine, the cell phone company. And he was 
you know, I had dinner with him and he was saying like, yeah, I can't build the towers. Like they won't give me the, they won't give me the, the permits to put the towers up. And we finally just got the permits for 3G. So we were able to put 3G up. But this is an American born and raised in Ohio, like owning a telecom company in Palestine. And they're not letting him have cell phone towers. And he's like explaining this. Um, so, I mean, it's just it, it, the world. But but they are getting Internet and the world is seeing more. And the tide and the sentiment is shifting and it's away from them. And there, it is in their best interest to change their ethos, the way they're operating, it's going to be the benefit of the Jewish people. But there is, I think, a rise in anti-Semitism because of Israel's existence and because of the way Israel behaves. And that is really, really unfortunate uh, for mm. all. And that's why I think more Jewish people, we're seeing more Jewish organizations and Jewish people speak up and say, we cannot be going down this road. This is not good for us, the Jewish people. Well said. Well, Kim, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Sorry, I talked so much. <laughs> There's so much more to say, but, um, but yeah, thank you for having me.